How to Cook Well with Rory O'Connell Proudly sponsored by Kerrygold Get closer to your cooking with Neff, Slide and Hide Proud sponsor of How to Cook Well with Rory O'Connell I love cooking and I love teaching people how to cook Good food is so important, not just for our health, but for our temperament, and it doesn't need to be complicated. For this series, I've created a set of menus which I hope you will try, either as individual dishes or as a complete and balanced meal. We're so lucky to have some of the best raw ingredients in the world. Let's make the most of them. I love cooking vegetables in unusual ways and who would have thought that you could grill scallions? Well you can, very easily, but you'll need to be brave when grilling them as it is crucial to leave them under the grill for long enough for them to both tenderise and colour sufficiently. The unexpected flavours here are really delicious. There's quite a bit going on in this dish with the mushrooms, anchovy egg and pan grattata, which are coarse roasted breadcrumbs. This is an interesting dish, delicious and definitely worth trying. So I'll begin this recipe by putting the scallions into the oven to grill or to roast, if you like, one or the other. So either a very hot oven or under the grill element, if your oven has one of those. The grill element is better, really. And drizzle them with a little bit of olive oil. Not drench, just a drizzle. And then just coat them like that. So they're all just lightly glazed. And then onto a tray in a single layer, or almost a single layer. They will shrink a little as they cook, and that allows plenty of space. A little salt at this stage to lift the flavour and a little pepper. And then under the grill, the cooking time, which takes about seven or eight minutes in my grill, might vary a little bit in yours. So I've got my grill turned on. Let's pop those in there. While they are grilling, I can deal with my mushrooms. And I've got these lovely, plump-looking, flat mushrooms, just slightly older mushrooms. I'm going to fry them in a little bit of olive oil. So slice them, and mushroom, onion, and anchovy really, really good together. So a little olive oil in my pan. Add in the mushrooms. And these take no length to cook. A little bit of salt. Not too much salt, because anchovy, which is very salty and which is such an important part of this dish, uh, features, and they are quite salty. So, quite a high heat. So we're cooking most of the water off the mushrooms. Now let's look at some of the other ingredients that we're going to puree the mushrooms with. I've got my anchovies ready, so some of them are chopped in the recipe and some of them then will be draped whole over the dish just at the very end. And the other thing I need are some thyme leaves. So I like a generous sort of teaspoon like that. Back to our mushrooms. Now our mushrooms have softened. See the way they're just, if I just press that, you'll see the way they're softened. I mean, they'd be lovely to eat just like that. So I'm going to decant these into my food processor. I'm happy to sprinkle my thyme leaves in there now so I don't forget them. And the other ingredients I'm going to put in there, and I'm happy to put those in now as well at this stage, is one tablespoon of olive oil and, curiously enough, one tablespoon of water. Okay. I can puree them, but I'm not going to put the anchovy in just for a moment. So the mushroom, it looks like a little sort of duck cell or coarse puree at this stage. You don't want it to be absolutely, completely smooth and fine. The other two ingredients, which I haven't spoken about yet for the finishing of the dish, are I've got some coarse breadcrumbs, and this is made with sourdough bread, and I've got some lovely hard-boiled eggs. Another day, I might finish this dish off with a soft poached egg, and that would be absolutely fantastic with the soft yolk melting down over the mushrooms and the scallions just as you're about to eat it. Ah, now... Things are really kicking off here. Okay, we're nearly there. In fact, I'm happy with those. And I love the way the little root ends go crispy. Really delicious. So I'm going to pop them onto a tray. I mean, you could, as I said, just take those straight to the table. Imagine those with a steak or a hamburger or any piece of grilled meat or fish, lovely. I can put my breadcrumbs into the same tray. Let's wash up. And drizzle a small amount of olive oil on those like that and these go under the grill be vigilant these can obviously toast too much 
uh, very easily. Look, I've got a tiny little bit of olive oil in that spoon there. Why don't I put that in? And these go back under there. Right, my mushrooms at this stage. So pop the chopped anchovy in and puree that again. Okay, that should be perfect. All the time I'm worrying about my crumbs here and I needed to be worried. Okay, that's all right. Okay, I've got enough. Some people wonder if I know what the word burnt means. I do know that that's burnt around the edge. We've got plenty of lovely toasty ones there. I love that combination of color there. So put that down there and don't forget in a moment, don't pick that up because it's going to be red hot. So to assemble it, it's very straightforward. Take the scallions and I usually do just a little sort of twist like that. A couple of spoons of the mushroom puree. Then the hard boiled egg, I usually just serve a half, you could serve a whole one. Just sitting up like that and just pulling in the scallions. You mightn't get so fiddly with it at home when you're trying to get to the table quickly. A little of the pan grattata to give a lovely crispness. One of the whole anchovies, just draped over the top like that. And a few little drops of olive oil, just as a last little dressing. So I think this is a lovely combination of flavors, really savory and light at the same time. And the savory nature of these ingredients will really whet your appetite for what's about to follow. This I think is a lovely thing, meat free, delicious. Making hollandaise sauce is one of those techniques that strikes fear into the hearts of many cooks. I'm going to show you that this fear is misplaced and also that this sauce, which is perceived as being very rich, can also be intriguingly light, pretty much as frothy and foamy as you'd expect in a restaurant. The technique for poaching the monkfish is simplicity itself. Altogether, this is practical, smart, delicious. So for the hollandaise sauce to go with the monkfish, there's a couple of small important rules. The main thing is good heat control and not having the heat too high here. And then it's not that difficult, I promise you. And once you can make hollandaise sauce, it's so good with so many different things. We're having it with the fish today. So I have two eggs, two good eggs, and I'm going to separate them. And I'm putting my egg whites into a spotlessly clean bowl here. And the two egg yolks, I'm putting it into a a heavy bottom saucepan. So with beautiful egg yolks, I'm going to put about a dessert spoon of water in there. Now there are various ways of doing a hollandaise sauce. Some people melt the butter and pour it in gradually boiling onto the egg yolks like you're making a mayonnaise, but I prefer the flavor of hollandaise made this way when the egg yolks go directly onto a low heat. We're going to whisk in the butter a couple of lumps at a time, maintaining that low heat. So just warming up the egg yolks just a little bit like that, and then three or four lumps of butter. So once the first few knobs of butter are whisked in and blended into the sauce, then add in some more. Always be able to put your hand or your finger on the side of the saucepan. If the saucepan gets a little bit hotter, so you, see you pull away your hand because it's too hot, take it off the heat for a moment. It's as simple as that. It's looking perfect consistency there. We always add a nice few drops of lemon juice to cut through the richness and to sharpen up the flavor. And that is hollandaise sauce without much fuss. Don't forget, while you're congratulating yourself, and you should do, um, to turn off the heat under the pot. Okay, otherwise you will come back in two minutes later and you'll have a scrambled egg, which wasn't what you were trying to achieve. So that's it. I'm going to pull that off the heat for a moment while I chop my herbs. I'm using some chives, perfect, to go with fish. You could put wild garlic in here, you could put dill, you could put parsley, it can be a mixture of herbs. So lovely chives like that. Then chervil, this is a beautiful, delicate herb. So a slightly mild oniony flavor from the chives, a um, slightly mild aniseedy licorice flavor from the uh, chervil and then a little bit more licorice, but not strong or overpowering, the beautiful, what, what do we call it, delicate sort of trembling fennel. God, whoever heard of trembling fennel? And oh, now you just did. All of these herbs are absolutely easy to grow, particularly spring, summer, autumn, and in a mild winter, 
And if you've got a very sheltered part of the garden, no problem with those. So they're going to go in. And see, I'm using plenty of herbs. So lovely green sauce like that. I mean, even that on a poached egg would be just fantastic. Okay, what I can do now is get my uh, monkfish on cooking. So I've got a saucepan here, which I'll just bring closer to me. Um, with some, just, at the moment, there's just some boiling water. So I don't add any herbs or anything to this water. What I do add is a big pinch of salt. So just simmering water, nicely salted, and then we're going to pop in our monkfish. So this is super easy. So just pop that in. And I'm fitting enough for four people in here, or maybe even a little bit more. Okay, I'm going to put the lid back on the saucepan for a moment, just to bring that up to a simmer. And I want it to simmer rather than to boil madly. And it'll cook in about three or four minutes. While that's happening, I'm going to whisk the two egg whites that are remaining and fold these into the hollandaise sauce. Get closer to your cooking with Neff Slide and Hide. Proud sponsor of How to Cook Well with Rory O'Connell. So this is pretty close now. I don't want to over whisk this. So lots of lovely foamy, frothy air in here. Now, we're going to fold this in here. So I'll take my whisk out. So try and keep everything nice and light. So the sauce is heavier than the egg white. So go right down to the bottom of your saucepan and lift up the, the flavoursome sauce because the egg white doesn't have a great deal of flavour, honestly. Great, okay, we're ready to go. So let's just check our monkfish. So I'll show you how you determine if it's cooked. Once it no longer looks translucent and feels firm to the touch, you don't want to overcook it because it gets dry quite quickly. So it feels a little bit springy. And then straight away, we're going to serve this. And we're going to serve this with a little bowl of peas on the side. A green vegetable of almost any description will be the perfect accompaniment for this. Then coat the fish with the lovely foaming hollandaise. So some of the lovely light chervil and some of the fennel and a few little chives. And to serve with this then, just some lovely peas. So some peas, which you could have added a little bit of mint to, but just lovely garden peas. And I have also which will be delicious with all of this. I have a few little pea tendrils, and then you have a gorgeous, all that lovely sort of greenness, um, which makes a perfect, light, delicious treat, definitely, because monkfish is a treat. A few little boiled new potatoes to go with that, heaven. Plum and almond is a classic combination of flavors and one that I love. And when encased within a puff pastry base, the result is really wonderful. The quality of puff pastry you use for the tart base is crucial for a delicious buttery flavour and a non-greasy texture. And I'm going to show you how to make it. For some reason, the idea of making puff pastry strikes fear into the heart of many experienced cooks. But really, there's no need to be scared and you will amaze your dinner guests when you tell them that the pastry they're enjoying has 729 layers. The finishing touch for this tart is the praline cream which is served for both flavour and sweetness. So to get the puff pastry started, perhaps for some people the most satisfying part of the process will be just softening up the butter a little bit. So what I do, I take my pound of butter and then just beat it like that. So we're not making it any colder, but we're making it more malleable and more spreadable. That's pretty much all you need to do at this stage. So you see the way I can bend it like that? Perfect. So we need to make now what's called a detrompe. And this is the dough that's going to hold the butter in place so we can create our 729 layers of pastry. So I've got my flour and then I've got some water. So I'm going to pour in most of the water and mix it around. I'll use a wooden spoon to start with. I'll probably get my hands in there then in a couple of minutes. So just mix and then add a bit more water as you need it. Now this is the point at which I'm going to get my hands in here. So just work it. Okay, so from there, we're just going to flour our work surface, 
take here de Trump. This seems very, very odd, but it's, it's sort of really amazing, the whole process. And then we roll out the dough into a square. Okay, so that's our little square-ish of de Trump. Now butter, retrieve it from the plastic bag, and I'm going to make this fit nice and neatly well in from the edges of the de Trump. What I'm going to do now is this, is fold in the edges like that we're making a parcel. Okay, and the butter is completely enclosed in our parcel. Now we have nearly one layer of pastry. It's still a long way to go. So like that, even just sort of not quite thumping it, but just pressing it like that. And that causes the pastry to start to spread. Now roll. And that's pretty much long enough at this stage. Brush off your excess flour, because that can prevent um, or cause the pastry layers to separate if there's flour in between those layers. Then fold it in three, and this comes over the top and meets there exactly. Then give it a 90 degree turn, so it's sitting in front of you like a book. So our second roll, again, making my corrugated impressions. Line up the edges, brush off the excess flour, And then I like to seal the edges with my rolling pin. And we've now given that two rolls and folds, or one, that's what's known as one double roll. And it just needs two more double rolls in total. And if you do the math, that's how you end up with your 729 layers of pastry. At this stage, it's crucial. It goes back into the fridge for at least 30 minutes. And it can be for several hours, if you want to, before we take it out again and do the next roll. Simple as that. So the first stage of this recipe is making the almond praline, which we're going to serve with the plum tart. So I've got some unskinned almonds and equal quantities of sugar. It can be either castor or granulated sugar, either will do. And that goes into a dry pan on a medium heat. What we're going to do is wait for the sugar to melt and become a caramel. And the next thing we're going to do is to prepare our plums. And I'm just going to halve them, so cut them around like that, and some plums are good humoured, and some plums are cantankerous. So let's see what we got here in terms of removing the stone. Give it a twist, and that's fine. You do want to maintain the nice shape of the plum. That's important. Then we need some lemon zest, because all of these sort of stone fruits love lemon. Zest that on. Okay, that's lovely. The colours already look beautiful with the golden plums. Then the sugar. That goes in and just gives all of those a mix around and they can be just sitting there. Nothing dramatic is going to happen there. Mind you, speaking of things dramatic, let's look back at the praline and now you can see a little bit of smoke. And it's starting to caramelise at this side of the pot here. So it's really important that I stir it. Just draw the crusty, crystallised looking sugar into the melting sugar which is becoming a caramel and keep the fates. Not until the last minute does all of that sugar melt out and you get a lovely caramel chestnut coloured syrup coating the roasted almonds. And then just pop that out onto your tray. Oh, interesting, I've got some almonds which now become part of the saucepan, that's all right. Get all of that syrup out, or as much of it as you possibly can. And then immediately, what I like to do, turn off the heat, is to just draw some of the individual almonds out of the pile. If you don't draw them out of the pile now, they will all stick together. Leave that to cool and be patient. Next thing, we're going to do our pastry. So now that we know that puff pastry is so easy to make, homemade puff pastry changes everything. If you're buying bought puff pastry, uh, which of course will be grand, make sure it's butter, all butter pastry, because that's the key to puff pastry is butter. Now, I'm doing a circular tart, so what I like to do is draw a template for myself in the flour like that. I've got my pastry here and roll out my pastry to the size I need it. So I usually start off by just making these impressions just to get the pastry to start to spread. So keep going towards your template, which sort of disappears in the flour, but you're basically aiming in the right direction. 
See, this pastry is so good humoured because it's fridge cold. If it gets any bit warm at all, given the amount of butter that's in the pastry, it just becomes more stretchy. Nothing worse than bad humoured pastry. Now, okay, that's plenty big enough. So I'm using a nice sharp knife and just cut down like that. And cut out your disc of pastry. Now, that's our disc to start with. But what I want here is to create an approximately one centimeter uh, line or cut inside the edge of the pastry. And the reason for doing that will become obvious in a moment. So what I do is I put my tin, line it up like that, press it just to make a sort of an impression lift it off and that gives me a good guideline for my one centimeter line. This will become a slightly risen edge on the assembled pastry. Okay that's that, just look to see you've cut all the way through which I have. So at this point I transfer it onto a baking sheet and because the pastry was cold it's easy to move. So pop that down there. Then take a fork and we're going to just not just mark the pastry this time. I'm going right the way through until I can feel the base of the tin. Okay, so the line to create a little ra raised edge of about one centimeter and the marks all over the base uh, to keep that pastry from rising up. Okay, so now the arrangement of the plums and the sugar. And at this point it looks as if there's way too much fruit, but there isn't. Uh, it's a tight fit, but that's okay. Now it's also worth noting at this point that I have brought in the plums just about a half a centimetre in from the edge, so they won't affect the edge of the pastry rising up. Pop those in the middle, and then any last little bit of sugar, lemony sugar, that's sprinkled over the top. That's gone into our oven preheated to 200 degrees, and then it takes about 45 minutes in total to cook. Now the tart is cooked, I can smell the lovely caramelised sugar aroma coming from the oven. And I like particularly when it gets these little sort of tinges around the edge of the plums. That really, really adds the flavour, tinge of colour that is. So the praline, now the almond and the sugar, has now solidified into a slab. And we have some of the lovely loose almonds there for decorating if we want to. So I need to grind this. And the easiest way to grind this is in a food processor. That's absolutely perfect. So let's see. So we have some dust and then some bits, you know, a little sort of quarter, a third, half a centimetre. That's exactly what I'm after. Now, some of that needs to go into our softly whipped cream. It's a lovely the sound of the praline hitting the cream. is kind of nice. Almonds and any of the plum fruit are just kind of mad about each other. So it's a very happy, very happy marriage. Sprinkle another little bit of praline powder on top of that. Lift your tart onto your place. I like to put a few of these whole almonds just scattered over the top. That's the lucky person's going to get three or four. And then in an ideal world, you take that straight to the table while the tart is still slightly warm. Um, and the lovely cold praline flavoured cream it's a good thing, whether it's with plums, apricots, peaches, or nectarines. Yeah, it's a nice thing. Get closer to your cooking with Neff Slide and Hide, proud sponsor of How to Cook Well with Rory O'Connell.